All right. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I presume you're able to see me. I'm not able to see whether or not you can see me. Um, I'll ask the panelists to turn on their uh, cameras as well so we can uh, get our get our program started today. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Catherine Perry. I'm an advisor with Fort Pitt Capital Group. Um, welcome to our Fort Pitt webinar series uh, about charitable gifting strategies, making the most of your donations. So a little bit about Fort Pitt Capital Group here uh, before we get started. Um, if you are unfamiliar with Fort Pitt, we are a financial advising and financial planning firm. Uh, we are located in Pittsburgh. We also have offices in Harrisburg and Florida. Uh, we offer a, a, a breadth of uh, services and abilities and capabilities with our, our firm um, on a grand scale, but then also do provide a uh, a, a more hands-on boutique approach to our, our, our handling our clients and helping our clients with achieving their goals. So, um, you know, we, we have a boutique feel, but we do have the breadth of and, and knowledge base and the backing of certified financial planners and traders and portfolio managers uh, to, uh, you know, work, work, work with our clients as well. So myself, uh, I'm Catherine Perry. I'm an advisor here, a certified financial planner here at Fort Pitt Capital Group. Uh, my job is to work with clients directly. Um, I work with clients to help figure out uh, their financial needs and what goals we're trying to achieve and how we can achieve them. Um, doing so, I partner up often uh, with, uh, as you'll see later, um, attorneys, um, uh, CPAs, uh, and, and you know, variety of uh, professionals to help uh, my clients uh, achieve their goals. So this is a, a part of a series of webinars that Fort Pitt is, is doing. Um, you know, we are trying to, um, you know, educate our, our, our clients, but then also, you know, the community as well. Um, we pride ourselves on being a resource for our clients. So we're not just financial advisors, we are life advisors, um, as, as that line says there. So we pride ourselves on being the financial go-to for all of our clients, no matter what it is. Um, and, you know, charitable planning is, is just another example, whether it be social security, retirement, whatever it is, um, we pride ourselves on being that person for our clients. So, you know, we, we are holding these webinars to help educate our clients, to help start conversations, um, and, you know, to see how we can help our clients and then also uh, maybe friends of clients or folks who aren't clients yet that are interested in, in learning about Fort Pitt and how we work. Uh, you know, we're also, we're, we're here and willing to help with that as well. So, you know, knowing that things can be confusing and challenging um, and it's an easy way to start the conversation with, with this series of webinars. So we're, we're happy to continue to do this. Um, I'll have a nice list of the 2021 webinars at the end of this program so you're able to see what what is upcoming as well. So some quick housekeeping items before we get going here. Um, so if you uh, would like to ask a question um, during the presentation, uh, myself, um, I will be monitoring the uh, uh, chat screen here to my left, well, my left. Um, so if there are any questions that come through, please feel free to uh, send them through. Um, if it's a timely question for the topic that is being discussed, I'm happy to answer it live. Uh, we've also left time at the end of our presentation to answer questions. Um, and if there's something we don't get to, we of course apologize and we'll make sure we follow up with that afterwards as well. So if you are watching us today on a device, um, if you look at uh, the picture in front of you, you're able to navigate and see where you'd be able to find those the, the place to ask questions. We also do have a place for you um, to see if there's any handouts that we have provided that you would be interested in as well. If you are on a computer, um, please see the photo in, in front of you. Um, in the top right hand corner, there's a little drop down box. Um, you, would, you would click that and then on there will be uh, questions um, and you will be able to um, find, you know, type out some questions or check out the handouts there as well. So you'll see that broken out there. So uh, without further ado, um, our panel today, uh, myself, Catherine Perry uh, from Fort Pitt Capital Group. We also have Amy Razum from the Pittsburgh Foundation and Nicole Fatak, an estate attorney from Clark Hill. So we will be discussing how we work with our clients about charitable gifting and charitable planning. Um, this is, you know, just to kind of framework the, the presentation today, you know, I will be talking about how I work with my clients and, and thinking and preparing for, uh, you know, 
from a from a legacy perspective, um, and then even in the near term, what we can do from a from a tax benefit standpoint um, that would help our clients from from that to uh, you know benefit from a charitable donation of sorts. Um, and I'm you know this is geared more towards the individual. So uh, you know I work with individuals. We do have folks here that work with businesses, but today the focus is really going to be uh, you know at least on my part um, about individuals uh, and how an individual person or family can can be. Uh, donating as well. Uh -huh. So uh, I thought it would be good uh, a good point to just break down charitable donations and what that is. So of course this is a timely topic. Um, you know being that we're at the year end we're doing tax year end tax planning. Um, so this is something that we are right in the in the midst of at, at the moment. Um, however, uh, you know this year in itself with, with the pandemic um, has really uh, shine a, shone a light on the need um, that charities have and nonprofits have, because there are lots of nonprofits and charities that rely on um, donations um, and the generous contributions of a lot of us, um, and then people that rely on those organizations. So it's a more of a trickle down effect. So, um, you know, this year especially, and then in the, in the coming years, as we see a fallout from all of this, uh, that will also be uh, a, a, a forefront type of an issue. So um, an interesting note that I, I found recently, uh, according to a recent Fidelity charitable study, um, approximately 60%, 68% of all giving is done by individuals. Um, so that's us, uh, us here, us working with our myself, working with my clients. Um, but I think that's very impactful and it's very important for us to continue to help our communities on an individual level, um, you know, because this is, again, something especially this year, uh, that we will need a lot of. So to just break down what a charitable donation is um, and to kind of frame this, I'm, I'm going to be speaking about a lot of things in the way of a tax benefit. So when I say deduction or things like that, that, that this has to do with taxes. I'm not a tax advisor. Um, I would recommend that any of my clients work with a tax professional. Um, however, I know enough to be dangerous in these areas. So framework what I'm going to mention and cover in, in that regard. So um, a charitable donation is a property, not a service. Um, for the sake of the IRS, um, it is deductible if made to a qual qualified charity um, in the tax year that it's donated. Now, the percentages down below there show the amount um, that you are able to offset on your taxes. Um, and it's limited by AGI. So that this percentage, for example, donor advised fund, six, you can write off about 60% of your AGI or up to 60% of your AGI, if you make a cash donation and appreciated assets would be 30%. Um, you know, the donor advised fund and private foundation topic uh, will be covered later in our presentation. So uh, if you're not familiar with those are, we will be covering that uh, shortly. Um, but the, the important piece here is the 100% cash, 100% of AGI cash donation that public you are, um, able to donate to a public charity this year. Um, that's something new this year. Uh, in the past, it's been 60% of AGI. Uh, this year, it's 100%, which is uh, which is wonderful, and that has to do with, with the effects of the pandemic as well. So uh, carry forward is allowable uh, in a lot of cases. Um, and again, I would I would recommend you work with your tax professional to uh, for your exact situation and, and what makes sense. Um, but it does allow you to do do good um, and then also be benefit you, uh, you know, in, in the process. So uh, with the CARES Act of 2020, there have been a couple of updates uh, in, uh, in regard to um, charitable donations. It was something that was included in the CARES Act. Um, the, the, one of the major things was the elimination of the RMD or required minimum distribution. Uh, so in some cases, it makes sense to hold a qualified charitable dis distribution for next year. And if you're thinking, what, what is a QCD, Catherine? Um, don't worry, I will go into it later on uh, in, in my piece here. I just wanted to you know, add in, these are some updates that the CARES Act changed because we get a lot of questions about that, especially when we're doing our year-end tax planning like we're in the middle of right now. We get a lot of, a lot of that and a lot of those conversations. Uh, the CARES Act did uh, add in a new above the line deduction um, of $300 uh, if, for charitable contributions if you do not itemize on your taxes. Um, but if you do itemize, um, it is allowing for up to 100% of AGI instead of the normal 60% on your taxes. Um, and again, disclaimer, I, I would recommend you work with your tax advisor on the specifics for you and your individual situation. 
I'm here to just inform you these are some changes and some updates that have come through. So on our agenda today, I'm going to talk uh, from the financial advisor standpoint where I sit from tax efficient donation methods that I work with my clients on a daily basis to help them do. Uh, so I'll be going through a couple tactics and a couple things that we use. Um, then we're going to go over donor advised funds and ways to leave a legacy. So uh, what is a donor advised fund? And when we're thinking long term um, from a whole planning standpoint, how does that come into play? And then finally, we'll be discussing estate planning considerations because all of this really does come into an estate plan uh, and figuring out what you know you and your plan needs to be to meet your goals. Uh, so we will be um, adding in that information as well. So uh, we will dive in. Uh, so one of the most common uh, practices that we use um, is gifting appreciated assets. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, it's a, a way of donating something that has a long-term capital gain to alleviate the capital gain um, from you, the, the donor. If you were to, and I'll, I'll use this specifically in my situation, we, you know, we're, I, I manage stocks, right? So stocks are, are something that we gift uh, often. Um, so if you bought a stock a long time ago, and it's grown in value, uh, that difference in, in value is a, is a long-term capital gain and that's taxable. One of the ways that you, we can help alleviate that is gifting the appreciated asset as a whole item to the charity versus selling it and giving the cash to the particular charity. Um, and you know, a lot of times in these situations when it comes to figuring out if it makes sense to gift the appreciated asset, or uh, in some cases to sell it and then donate the cash. That is all a fun game that we get to play with our accountants and, and play the numbers game behind the scenes. Um, but what makes more sense? Also, trusts are a, great, are, are a great way to help accomplish this too. And Nicole will go into that later on in the presentation. Um, something uh, of gifting appreciated assets. Uh, like I said, you just kind of pick up your asset and give it to the charity as is as a whole. So, so this tactic is usually used um, when someone does not itemize on their taxes. I'm sorry, they, when they can itemize on their taxes um, or there are, their required distribution from their IRA won't put them into a higher tax bracket, which we'll discuss later for the qualified charitable distribution piece, um, or, or, and or you own highly appreciated assets in a taxable account. Uh, like I said, I can give you an example. A lot of times with our clients, we have highly appreciated stock. Over the years, we've made our clients lots of money. They have stock that's, that's worth way more than it was when we bought it. So figuring out ways to uh, be able to give to charity, charity because they are terribly inclined, but then also figure out ways to uh, do that in the most tax efficient uh, manner. So uh, there also is a concept, and I'm not going to go too deep into this, but you may or may not have heard the buzzwords. That's why I wanted to address it. Um, it's uh, called bunching. Um, so that means making your large charitable donation in one year. Um, this was something, this is something that's newer because they did raise the, the tax threshold to be able to itemize and get a benefit for making a donation to charity. So. Uh, the, the bunching strategy, if you may or may not have heard of it, it's really just making your making a larger contribution to get the, the tax benefit in one year uh, rather than doing it over a number of years. I'm not going to go further into it than that because there's a little bit more complex nuance behind it. However, um, like I said, it is a buzzword and I want to address it. If anyone has any questions about it, happy to talk offline about it, or I'd recommend you just talk to your tax advisor as well. So without further ado, uh, the qualified charitable distribution uh, that I had alluded to earlier uh, is something that, again, we do very frequently with our clients. Um, and we actually did have a question come through before our presentation started about this. I'm happy to be able to answer that now. So what a qualified charitable distribution from an IRA is, is really just taking your required distribution that you are required to take every year once you hit a certain age and gifting it to charity. So it, it goes directly from your IRA to a charity, counts as it, it fulfills the required distribution requirement. However, you do not have to pay the taxes on it um, as you would if you were to just take withdraw uh, the funds from your account. So um, that is something that 
we use often um, for folks who are, again, are charitably inclined, um, have a lot of uh, retirement assets, um, and then potentially a required distribution will jump bump them up into the next tax bracket. We can see what we can we can do with that. Um, some you know little little pieces to go with that. You must be 70 and a half or older. Now I'm fully aware. Oops. <laughs> now I'm fully aware that uh, the required distribution age was changed to age 72. Um, however, they did uh, grandfather in the 70 and a half uh, age for qualified charitable distributions. So anywhere over 70 and a half, you're able to make a charitable distribution, um, you know, it, 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 as needed. The ma maximum amount they're able to do per year is 100,000 per year. Um, and again, work with your advisor on figuring out what the most suitable method and route is for you. Um, but again, we, we do this frequently um, to for, for, our, for our clients. Um, the, a couple nuances with this is that we can't use the required distribution the qualified charitable distribution towards a donor advised fund or private foundation, which will be discussed later. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, this is usually used with clients who don't itemize and then have lots of retirement assets and have larger required distributions. Um, Cause I'm sure as you know, when you take money out of an IRA that is taxable at that time. So we're trying to minimize the amount of taxes that the client has to take out at that time. Um, and then just a couple other things I wanted to touch on. Um, so re re, uh, from reducing a tax burden standpoint, I'm going to be very high level with this Roth, Roth conversion topic um, because it does, I could get in the weeds with it and I'd rather not <laughs> uh, for the sake of this presentation. Um, however, if you do a Roth conversion, um, you do pay tax on, on the assets in that particular year. So that in that year, those assets, that's taxable. Whatever you converted is taxable. So uh, a way to in a sense, get around that or to help offset that is in the year you're doing a Roth conversion, do a charitable contribution as well. That way you're able to, uh, you know, benefit from the tax, uh, the tax deduction from making the charitable contribution to help offset the taxes that you paid with the Roth, Roth conversion. Again, I can get in the weeds with that and I'd rather not <laughs> confuse everyone on the webinar today. So I'm happy to talk offline about that uh, if there are particular questions. Uh, you know, like I said, that is, helps you offset your taxes and it's really best for those who have longer time horizons as well um, to, do a, to do a Roth conversion. Um, and then the uh, cash gifts, as I mentioned earlier, um, the percentage is the amount that, that you're allowed to use from a tax benefit standpoint. Um, the percentages that I mentioned earlier on your AGI, those, are, those apply, um, as I mentioned, the $100, or I'm sorry, 100% of AGI this year that you're able to um, offset uh, with cash gifts to a charity is fantastic. Um, that's something that you, know, you can utilize uh, well. And then if you do not itemize on your taxes, um, they, again, there is the up to $300 um, that they're allowing um, folks who make charitable contributions if you don't itemize. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Amy Rasm from the Pittsburgh Foundation to tell us about donor advised funds and private foundations. So Amy. Thank you so much, Catherine. Hi, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Amy Rasm. I am a development officer. Um, at the Pittsburgh Foundation. And um, before we get into, um, you know, how we operate and some of the fund types that we offer our donors, I wanted to give a very high level introduction to who the Pittsburgh Foundation is and what we do. Catherine, next slide, please. So the Pittsburgh Foundation uh, is your local community foundation. Um, we are a bona fide 501c3. And, um, you know, we have two sides of the house. We have the side of the house that I live on, which is working directly with donors. Um, and I work really closely with financial advisors in the community. I partner with CPAs and estate attorneys, just like Nicole and Catherine, um, to really help their clients, their charitably inclined clients, uh, realize their highest ideals and provide them with a plan um, moving forward um, for their uh, charitable gifts. And then the other side of our house is our program team. And they are responsible for grant making back into the community. 
So they are gift, they're officers that are um, really ingrained in the work of a specific sector. So we have an arts and culture program officer, we have um, healthy humanities, um, housing and transportation. And so they are really in the community, on the ground, doing work with the nonprofits um, and, and helping them move their missions forward. So wanted to give that high level overview of how the Pittsburgh Foundation operates and how I work with donors and also advisors in the community. So as you can see, we are the 15th largest um, local community foundation in the country. We have been around for a while. We're 75 years old. Um, currently, we're hovering about $1 billion under asset management. But I think the most important thing to know about the Pittsburgh Foundation is that when you open a fund with, with us, um, that fund is a permanent endowment, which means that it's going to be around in perpetuity. So if you choose to open a donor advised fund, for example, at the Pittsburgh Foundation, um, we are going to work with you during your lifetime to help you realize your highest ideals and make the connection for you to nonprofits or fields of, of charitable interest um, so that forever um, those organizations will be able to receive funding to continue the work um, that they do in our communities. Next slide, please. Oh, I think, yep, what, yep, there you go. One more click, there we go. So um, as Catherine touched on, a donor advised fund is a great vehicle for those folks that are charitably inclined. Uh, at the Pittsburgh Foundation, you can start a donor advised fund with a $10,000 gift. And, um, you know, that could be started with, as Catherine said before, you know, appreciated assets are a great tool to be able to open a donor advised fund. Um, and realize that, that tax benefit. So once you would make a gift into the fund, that gift would then be um, invested to grow over a forever time horizon. Um, and as an example, I just talked to somebody yesterday who um, you know, needed to bunch uh, a donation into one year to be able to realize that, that tax benefit this year but the really nice thing is, is that they don't have to worry about making a grant to any nonprofit organization until next year or until they're ready. So they're gonna make uh, the initial contribution to open their donor advised fund this year with appreciated assets. And then down the road, next year, a couple months from now, they can say, okay, now we're ready to make some grants to organizations in the community. And that's what's so great about a donor advised fund is that it is definitely the most flexible product um, to be able to help folks with their charitable giving. Um, there is no minimum spend out requirement from a donor advised fund. Um, where in contrast, uh, a private foundation, for example, they do have uh, a minimum disbursement requirement per year. And being a part of a larger um, foundation like the Pittsburgh Foundation, donors with advised funds don't have to worry about that regulation. So, you know, this, this folk, these folks that opened uh, a donor advice fund this year with an appreciated securities gift, you know, they can continue to help organizations annually with gifts from their fund. So the organization doesn't lose out on those annual gifts, but the client still was able to take that tax deduction. So it really is a great tool. Um, and one of the really nice things about what I do and the thing that I love the most about my job is that I get to work out in the community with advisors like Catherine and firms like Fort Pitt Capital um, to help their, their clients. And um, part of our program at the Pittsburgh Foundation is that we do work with a many um, advisors in the community that are approved to manage the charitable assets of their clients. Um, we call this a third party manager program. So in essence, the, the financial advisor that you have trusted throughout your life to help you grow your, your financial health um, can continue to manage those charitable assets if you decide to open a donor advised fund at the Pittsburgh Foundation. So once the fund is opened and things are invested and they're growing, and you're able to make grants back out in the community, really that's what this is all about, is to be able to help those folks that, that need the help the most in our communities um, and really help you plan your legacy. So you'll see at the bottom of the slide that I have other fund types. So 
We do at the Pittsburgh Foundation um, carry other fund types that, that folks could open, such as scholarship funds. We have um, about 355 scholarship funds that we do um, uh, run and utilize. Um, they're a great way for donors to be able to sit on a scholarship committee and choose recipients for said scholarship throughout um, a, a year. And we also have designated funds, um, which are a great tool for people that know every year annually they're going to give to their alma mater um, or they're going to give to their local food bank. It's a great way to just establish a fund and know that every year the foundation will take care of sending that organization um, their, their gift from your fund. It's almost like you set it and forget it. The other great thing about these two types of funds, the scholarships and the designated funds, is that they can be opened with IRA QCDs, like Catherine had mentioned before. The IRS does have regulations around how folks can utilize their RMDs, um, and there are basically uh, two options. The first option is you can send it directly to a charity. So you could send it directly to um, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, um, or if you would like, you could set up a scholarship fund or a designated fund at the Pittsburgh Foundation. And then every year, you know, if you don't want to use your RMD, you can add to your fund. And if you need it that year, that's okay too, because once your fund is open, like I said, it's invested, it's growing, it's going to be around forever. So if you can't make a donation in one year, that's okay. You're still going to see interest come off of that fund and be able to either make a scholarship or grant back into the community. Next slide, please. So really at the end of the day, you're probably saying to yourself, wow, Amy, this is really great information, but really as a donor, why would I choose to go with the Pittsburgh Foundation over say, starting a private foundation? And really at the center of this is you. At the center of, of what we do are our donors and their most trusted advisors. So like I said, you know, I work with Catherine, I work with Nicole, helping their clients to be able to have that long-term plan, um, not only uh, for them, but for their kids. Um, so one of the things that, that, that we do is our oversight. So because the Pittsburgh Foundation is, is the 501c3 charity, we do all of the back office accounting work. We file 1990, we make sure that grants are sent to the organizations um, and used in the way that you had instructed. Um, you know, we have folks on staff, so you don't have to worry about, you know, having a staff person. You know, with private foundations, there's a required minimum spend out every year. Um, you know, you have to have staff, you have to do all of the filing with the IRS, you have to keep people entertainer. It's a very big process. So you get the benefit of a private foundation and that you get to feel good about your legacy and what you're doing to help the community, but you don't have to worry about all of the back office work. Um, you know, we are all trained in multi-generational and um, family planning facilitation. So all of our donor services representatives are there to help have conversations. Um, if you have successor advisors that you want to take over the fund when you're no longer here, um, you know, we have the availability to do that as well. Obviously, grant making expertise. And I like to point out that we have folks that come to the Pittsburgh Foundation that are, you know, they're philanthropists. They have a heartbeat on, you know, what exactly they want to fund and causes that are near and dear to them. And they're pretty good. They don't really need much help. Then we have folks that come to us and say, I want to be philanthropic. I just don't know how. And so folks that open funds with us in that vein, you know, they really utilize um, the service of their donor services representative in that they help them make that plan and grant to organizations um, that, you know, they discover um, through research uh, with, their, with our Center for Philanthropy. And so, you know, it, you could be a seasoned philanthropist or say, you know what, I actually need some help um, and we'll be there for you either way. We can do unscheduled visits to local nonprofits um, if you're interested in, in touring and really educational seminars. But more than that, being a part of the Pittsburgh Foundation means that you are part of a community. You're a part of just something bigger than just a charitable checking account. And I'll, I'll give you one example. 
I worked with a donor, I want to say two years ago, who had a um, donor advised fund at another provider of Fidelity or Schwab. And she said, you know, it operates fine. It's like a checking account. I don't feel like I'm involved. I don't feel like I know what I'm making a difference with. Um, you know, I don't get to see any reports from nonprofits on the impact that they have. Um, and I'm just looking for something a little bit more engaging. And so she she ended up moving her fund over to the Pittsburgh Foundation, and she has been active and engaged um, with our webinars and, and educational seminars ever since. Um, you know, before the pandemic hit, um, we at the Pittsburgh Foundation hosted donor events every year, um, at least two, to be able to introduce folks to maybe some nonprofits or part of town that they had never been exposed to before. Um, next week, we're having a, a planned giving um, webinar with one of our trusted uh, partners out in the community uh, to educate our donors about um, actually what Nicole will talk about in a little bit, um, you know, about estate planning. If they currently aren't thinking or maybe starting to think about their estate plan. So being a part of the Pittsburgh Foundation is not just you're giving in a void, you don't know where your money is going. Um, you have a whole team of people to be able to, to help you do that. And really, you can grant to any 501c3, whether it's locally, regionally, or nationally. Uh, next slide, please. So a conversation about charitable giving can really uncover a lot. Um, as Catherine mentioned, they have great, it's great tax benefit. Um, you know, I'm not here to convince you to be charitable. I'm just here to let you know that there are resources out there um, should you want or need to, to be able to um, take advantage of, of some great tax benefits. You know, we have people come to us all the time that say, you know, I want to honor my mom. Um, I want to create a legacy for my family. I want to get my kids involved. Um, it's a great way to deepen relationships um, within your own family, but also with your most trusted advisors. And again, that planning for generational succession, um, teaching your kids, teaching your nieces, and nephews about why it's important to give back to the community in which we live, work, and play. And at the end of the day, helping the community. I mean, we all we all have soft spots in our hearts for causes and, and populations of folks that, that need the help. So really, we're, we're here because we all care, right? We all care about our neighbors, um, and we care about causes that, that are near and dear to us. We want them to be able to continue the work that they're doing way down the road. So with that, I know I have talked a lot um, about how you can make a difference during your lifetime, um, while you're alive, making grants to organizations. Um, you know, but now Nicole is going to talk about uh, st strategies for leaving behind a legacy through your estate plan. So Nicole, take it away. Nicole, can you hear us? We can't hear you. All right, everybody, can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank, Thank you for your patience. Perfect. Um, we were having some technical difficulties this morning, which is why I'm listed as Miranda and not Nicole, but I am Nicole. And I first wanted to thank Catherine and Fort Pitt Capital for inviting me to speak to you today on different ways you can use your estate plan to fulfill your goals for charitable giving. So my goal today is not to uh, put you to sleep or bore you too much. Uh, I have given presentations on this matter well over an hour. So since we only have about uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes, I'm going to keep it very high level, um, give you the, the overview, and I'm more than happy to answer any follow-up questions any of you have afterwards. So Catherine, if you could go to the first slide, please. The most basic, um, and this is actually just a little bit about Clark Hill. Um, I am a member in their tax and estate planning group, and we have offices um, across the country. We have over 25 offices. And um, our group here in, in Pittsburgh can help you with any of your estate planning needs. Um, we can also do estate plan in many other um, places across the country, uh, Detroit, Chicago, Texas, we have many other offices there. 
Um, Catherine, go ahead and get the next slide. So the most basic way to make a charitable gift in your planning after death is through your last will and testament. So creating a specific bequest in that will is this obviously the simplest way to make a gift to charity. It can be monetary or non-monetary, but it's very, very important to list the legal name of the charity. Um, we've ran into cases before in estate administrations where they just put, you know, the Pittsburgh Animal Shelter and there's no Pittsburgh Animal Shelter. And who do you give it to? Is it Animal Rescue League? Is it Animal Friends? Um, we've also run into cases where they list a large charity such as the Red Cross but they really wanted it to go to the Pittsburgh branch of that or their local branch. So it's very important um, to make sure your legal name of the charity is listed. And a lot of times that's as simple as Googling it, to be honest with you. The nice thing about a gift in a will is that you can basically direct how the gift is going to be used at the charity. So you can be as specific or as non-specific as you like. So I have an example here where this particular client wanted to make a gift of $50,000 to the animal shelter but it was to be used for providing affordable medical care and treatments, including spay and neuter services, vaccinations, and other basic pet care to low income pet owners. So that was a very specific um, goal. Some people wanna direct specific gifts um, for diseases they've dealt with during their lifetime, causes that are near and dear to their family, and we can do that through your will. Uh, next slide, please. There's also the concept of a revocable trust in estate planning. Um, the individuals can use this to direct the trustee to distribute funds to a charity through the terms of the trust. A revocable trust is basically a will substitute. It's a little more advanced planning for those clients who want to avoid the probate administration and the publicity of that process. And that can be amended or revoked during your lifetime. So as simple as the gifts with the wills, the gifts can be general or specific in your revocable trust as well. And the trustee is the one that is making and carrying out those gifts as opposed to the executor at the time of death. Next slide, Catherine. So those are the simple ways of making a gift at time of death. Um, we're gonna get into a couple of little more advanced areas of estate planning um, for if you have higher wealth, or looking at doing something a little more philanthropic. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the different types of charitable trusts. And like I said, hopefully this doesn't put you to sleep. Um, the slides are all available afterwards for you to refer to, and I'm happy to go into more detail about these if you'd like at a later date. The first is the Charitable Remainder Annuity Trust, which is referred to as a CRAT. Um, in the estate planning world, we have abbreviations for everything. So in this case, with the CRAT, the grantor irrevocably transfers assets to the trustee, which means that if you're creating this trust, you're completely divesting yourself from these assets and you don't have any farther use or control over them. The trustee then makes fixed annual payments to the grantor, the person creating the trust, you, or other beneficiaries as you would like. The amount of these annual payments have to be at least 5% of the trust assets initial fair market value. That is in the IRS regulations. And it's generally taxable to the beneficiaries. So those payments that are being made to the beneficiaries each year will have to be reported on their personal income tax returns. At the end of the trust term, the assets remaining in the trust, so whatever is left, is distributed to the charity that you specify as the grantor. So for example, I could create a CRAT in which I am the beneficiary during my lifetime. I could put in just say a million dollars. I collect at least 5% of that initial fair market value. So 5% of the million dollars each year. But it, when I'm gone, the money passes automatically to charity. So if I as a grantor am entitled to an income tax deduction for what is called the present value of the remainder trust. And that is a calculation we make um, as estate planners, it is not a, a very basic calculation. It's kind of a convoluted, but basically they're trying to value what they expect you to use during your lifetime because the rest would pass to charity tax rate. One of the nice things about a CRAT is that any capital gain on appreciated assets is bypassed. So a lot of clients like to use these, for example, to make gifts of um, 
closely held businesses, property, things that have a very low basis. This is something that Catherine spoke of before because they're trying to get these items out of their estate that they're basically their beneficiaries or themselves don't have to recognize large capital gains at a later date. Um, one thing to remember about the CRAT is that additional contributions are not permitted. This is a one-time contribution and a one-time gift. The other type of remainder trust is a charitable remainder unit trust, which is referred to as a CRUD. The main difference between these two types of trust is that the unit trust payments vary from year to year. So it can be a percentage of the trust income, a percentage, um, sometimes you'll say, okay, 4% of income each year, 7% of income each year, but these payments can vary. The goal of the trust is that it's to provide payments to the donor for life. So if I create the trust, it's to provide payments to me or upon a term of up to 20 years. If you do specify a term under life, you can only go up to 20 years. At the end of the term, the remaining assets pass in trust to the specified charity, just like the CRAT. In this case, there is an immediate charitable income tax deduction, which is really nice for our clients. And once again, you can avoid capital gains on long-term appreciated property, which is used to fund the trust. The one difference between this trust as opposed to the CRAT is that additional contributions can be made. So this is something that you could perhaps as the grantor make a contribution to yearly, bi-yearly, whatever you would like. Next slide, please. Okay, you're back, we're back to the charitable lead trust. So the charitable lead trust is basically the opposite of a charitable remainder trust. So when you think about a charitable remainder trust, the idea is that you are still getting a portion of the income during your lifetime, but you want the balance, whatever you don't use to go to the charity. A charitable lead trust is once again an irrevocable trust, meaning it can't be changed or amended, but it creates an income stream for the charity. And upon death, the remaining assets eventually go to the beneficiaries you specified that are non-charitable. So once again, you would make a contribution to the charitable remainder trust, the charitable lead trust. And you could say, for example, I'm gonna give 5% each year to ABC Animal Shelter or to a donor advised fund at the Pittsburgh Foundation. At the end of the term of the trust or your life, then the assets, whatever's left, go to that charity. So basically, uh, to the beneficiaries, excuse me. So you could say it goes to my children, it goes to my nieces and nephews, it goes to my spouse, whomever you want it to be. So the idea is to provide an income stream to the charity while preserving the principal and the balance for your heirs. It's the perfect vehicle for assets that you want returned to the family. So if you're not willing to fully divest the family of those assets, this works very well. Um, the catch with the charitable lead trust is that it is not tax exempt. This is something to keep in mind for income tax purposes. There are actually two types of charitable lead trusts, and we're just gonna talk about this very briefly. The first is a non-grantor charitable lead trust. And keep in mind the word grantor simply means the person creating the trust. With a non-grantor lead trust, the trust income each year is not taxable to the grantor. I mean, it's not taxable to me as the person creating the trust. I would also not receive an income tax deduction for creating the trust. So while it's not taxable to me, I don't get any benefit either for income tax purposes. The trust itself pays the tax on the income and would claim a charitable deduction for the amounts it pays to charity. So the trust is an income taxable entity, just like any individual or corporation, and it would file its own form 1041 each year reporting income. The other type of charitable lead trust is a grantor lead trust. In this one, I, as the person creating the trust, could take an immediate charitable deduction for what we call the present value of the future income stream. So once again, it's a calculation to determine what that value would be over my life. This is subject to those applicable percentage limitations. Um, those are the limitations that Catherine mentioned earlier as far as the percentages of your AGI or your adjusted gross income that you're allowed to deduct. The catch with the grantor lead trust is that the benefit of that is mitigated by the fact that the trust income is taxable to me as the grantor during the term, and there's no offsetting future charitable deduction as the amounts are paid for charity. So I get a one-time charitable deduction, but as I'm continuing to get taxed on the income being made, 
money is going out to the charity, but I do not get an additional deduction for that charitable deduction every year. So it's kind of an offset in that case. You will pay the full amount of the income with no offset. And that's really all I had. I know Catherine and Amy had more to chat. Um, state planning, there's a lot of different issues. We, we didn't talk about many things. Um, and that's just meant to be an overview. I'd be happy to answer any specific questions anybody has about the trust or estate planning we talked about. And thank you, Catherine. Sure. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Amy. I uh, appreciate you joining us today. Oh, my lights are on a timer in my office. So bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> the fun of, of live TV, right? Um, so we, we did actually have a couple questions come through during the presentation um, that you know I think we would be able to answer. Um, so the first one I think uh, is for me. Uh, uh, it's can you donate from a 401k or other type of uh, retirement account in addition to an IRA? So if you're referring to the QCD or qualified charitable distribution uh, piece, those can only be done from an IRA. Um, so you can make uh, charitable those kinds of charitable contributions from other retirement accounts. Uh, and then. Um, Nicole, this actually the second one is for you. Um, so the question is, what is the best candidate for a charitable lead trust, or is there a certain dollar amount to be of value to the donor? Um, there's not a specific uh, dollar amount. Um, you, it depends how much bang you want for your buck, right? Because the more money you're putting in, the more benefits you're getting. So I've seen people do them, um, you know, for a hundred thousand. I've seen people do them for a million. Um, it depends on whether you want the non-grantor or the grantor lead trust we talked about as well. But um, I really think, you know, it's something to explore with either myself or your estate planning attorney as to whether the benefit is there. And then they can also easily make that calculation we talked about, which is the amount of the present income stream and let you know how much of a deduction you're getting. Um, so a lot of times what we do for clients is we say, OK, um, here's a couple different models. Here's a couple different terms, five, 10, 20 years. Here's what happens when you put certain amounts in and we're able to present them with all the options to see what they, uh, kind of deduction they can get. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think, you know, the rest of the questions that had come through before our presentation, I think we, we, we touched upon them. So um, in, in the chat box, anything, any other questions, I think we've already addressed so that, that it's wonderful. We weren't inundated and ran out of time with questions. Great. Um, but of course, you know, we are happy to answer any questions offline or after after the presentation today as well. So, you know, you know, I think it's very important. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, a, a timely topic um, for us to learn about ways to make an impact in our community, uh, but then also doing it in the most efficient way possible um, with sending money to your favorite charity, uh, you know, setting up current uh, current ways to make charitable gifts and future uh, ways, ways to leave a legacy, um, you know, working with your team of advisors who I'm going to call all of us on, on the, on the you know, panel here today. Um, but it really is, is a, it's a group effort, you know, figuring out what is best for each person, um, you know, working with your tax advisor, your estate attorney, your financial advisor, you know, with the team at the Pittsburgh Foundation. Um, a lot of people are here to help and, you know, answer questions. Uh, so, you know, keep keep that in mind. And again, it's it's very important to, in my opinion, to you know help and give back to our community. Um, so really quickly, um, just kind of a, a plug for our upcoming webinars uh, for Fort Pitt in the year 2021. I'm not going to redo the list. However, you're able to see that we have a whole lot coming up next year. So stay tuned. Um, if you are on the distribution list for the webinar today, you will most likely get an email invitation for these upcoming uh, webinars. Um, but if there's something specific you had questions about or wanted to learn about, uh, please feel free to check us out on the website, fortpittcapital.com. Uh, anytime there's a webinar coming up, we will have uh, something listed there as well. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank you all. Um, thank you, Amy, and thank you, Nicole, uh, for joining us today. And, and thank you to everyone who, who tuned in and, and uh, was able to bear with us with our minor technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, as I said, this is the fun of live TV <laughs> in the age of, of, of cyber, uh, you know, all the cyber stuff that we're doing. So again, thank you very much. Um, 
are if there's any questions that you have, please feel free to contact any of us directly. Our email and our contact information is on the uh, page in front of you. Um, you will be getting a follow up as well. So uh, we're happy to answer any additional questions offline. So I hope you all stay well and stay healthy and have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you.